Hello, Namaste. I'm Ruchira Gupta, your host for the podcast A Free Voice. I'm an Emmy-winning journalist who went on to start Apnea, an NGO which works against sex trafficking. I have dedicated my life to amplifying voices of the most marginalized people in the world. I'm also the debut author of scholastic book I Kick and I Fly. In this podcast, I will talk to survivors, activists and storytellers who use their voice to make a difference in the lives of young people. How does an idea turn into action? How do you change a tragedy into recognizing your own powers? Together, we will examine and reimagine the world we want. Outside, the sky was pale. This is Kreutzberg, for Krull announced. That way no man's land, he said, wheeling around for a second. We resumed walking, st- staying parallel to the overhead bridge of Görlitzer Bahnhof. I stopped to study a Mercedes-Benz. It was a model I'd seen and even got into as a child, a 250. It looked unaffected by the seasons. Behind it was a small car. The excitement of confronting something you don't know is very like the excitement of recognizing something you were familiar with long ago. What is this? I asked. It was new to me and incredibly old. Fakrul tried reading its name, but I think he was bluffing when he said, it's an East German model. There was a hint of pleasure in his words. It could have been a Soviet make, self-sufficient, redundant. Come, said Fakrul, beckoning. He'd stopped before a board. It had flyers pinned to it. See, he said. I flinched. It was a photograph of a nude woman. I flinched not because it was obscene, but what did he have in mind? Was this an avuncular initiation? The photo was black and white. The woman's outlines, breasts, shoulders, were rounded, soft. It was from 1923. I could guess at enough of the text to understand it announced an exhibition of erotic pictures from the time. See, said Fakrul. I paused at the eyebrows, pale nipples, and navel. 1923 meant nothing. The woman was in a now, and all else was irrelevant. And this one, he said, pointing to another poster. Off theatre. Something out of the way. I didn't know what the poster said. I imagined what off theatre implied. This board, he said, gesturing with a hand is for off theater. You just heard Amit Chaudhary read from his latest book, Sojourn. This has been published by New York Review of Books. It's set in Berlin and it has the universal theme of exploration, getting lost and finding oneself. Thank you, Amit, for joining us in the Bowery Poetry Club studio to talk to us about books, yourself, life, and whatever else that you have done to make a difference in the lives of those around you. Amit Chaudhary is a writer, a professor, a musician, and also someone who works hard to preserve the heritage of the city that I was born and grew up in, and he was born and grew, grows, is still living in, Calcutta. Welcome, Amit. Thank you, Ruchira. Thanks. It's good to be here. You've been wandering around New York for the last one week, uh, just like you wandered around Berlin in your imagination and in re- reality, I presume. Uh, what do you feel about New York right now? Right now, at this point of time, at this moment, I've, I'm feeling very um, sort of positively towards New York um, on this visit. Um, I kind of have a sense not only of its history, uh, that, you know, I, I, I get a kind of uh, sense of connection I feel a sense of connection to its spaces, its its history, but also to its ordinary people, um, more so than I have on previous visits. So I, between two thousand and eight to two thousand and nineteen, I've been coming to New York almost every year, and before that, I was here in two thousand, which for me was 
a, a, a moment in which I confronted a changed New York because the first time I'd been to New York was in 1979. And that New York I had felt very taken with in the way I felt taken with Calcutta when I first encountered it. You, you were right to say that I grew up, uh, sorry, uh, that I was born in Calcutta. Yes, I was born in Calcutta, but I grew up in Bombay. Right, that's your book. Yeah, yeah, right. So, and visiting Calcutta was for me an encounter with modernity and all its contradictions that, you know, the urban could be seemingly modern and derelict at the same time, about to fall apart, but come to life at once. Uh, and that these contradictions is something that both moder modernity and the modern city could accommodate. Um, and the Western cities, uh, uh, when I was growing up, I had come into contact with them early, used to bore me a little bit. And certainly my first port of call in uh, America, which was San Diego, bored me in a, in a way that perplexed me because it was very pretty. But it was my first encounter with American suburbia or the suburb uh, anywhere. And I couldn't understand it as to why I felt depressed uh, in a place which was seemingly, you know, pretty and beautiful. Um, then I arrived in New York with my parents uh, in 79. I was 17 years old. And I imme immediately something in, came, in me came to life. And this New York was a, a kind of New York which was... Um, uh, uh, when you look back at the history, it was not in boom time at all. It was, you know, oppos the opposite. It wasn't doing well. But yet it it's kind of, I think its imaginative life was flourishing. It, it had a kind of unpredictability and it also could accommodate the fact that, you know, the city could be derelict and alive at once. Uh, it, it needn't be pretty and dead in the way San Diego, the San Diego suburb was. So, uh, um, that says something, of course, about my particular tastes and predilections and what brings me to life. But um, that that city reminded me then in 79 of Calcutta, of, of my encounter with the modern, uh, as I now call it, in Calcutta. So um, 2000, it seemed like a different New York. Um, everything had been filtered out, you know. This time, so in, in my, during my visits, between, as I said, say around 2008 to 2019, before the pandemic, uh, I have enjoyed the city, but also been slightly, you know, I haven't been able to quite figure it out. There's, there, there, there seemed to me a kind of deadness creeping in with gentrification. Some people, uh, one person, Jessica Crispin, said, of course, that, um, you know, all the interesting bits have been bought out. You know, mm -hmm. and so all those people have moved. The people who made it interesting have uh, moved elsewhere, and what's left now are those interesting spaces occupied by extremely rich people. So that that brings the deadness to it. Um, so that kind of explained it to me somewhat. You know, the the whole process of gentrification, that you know, property prices are cheap. Uh, the more more interesting people, the bohemian set, come in. This happened in East Berlin as well after reunification, re and they transform the areas, make them interesting, and then those interesting areas now in the time of globalization get because they're interesting get um, bought out yeah. by, by by the super rich, and then they cease to become interesting. And this is what I must have intuited in New York. But this time on this visit, I felt I feel that there is a kind of level of ordinary life among ordinary people who live in New York, working class people too, which I which I felt connected to in the street, uh, just as in terms of their daily rhythms. And I, I thought maybe one of the reasons might have been that I was here this time with my wife and that maybe that made me kind of more open, uh, less kind of um, defensive and closed uh, to experiencing New York. But uh, But definitely this time, it seems more alive. Yeah, and I think also New York itself is uh, going through a transformation. It's post two years of COVID lockdowns. Students are back in colleges. And also there is a burst of creative energy which has come out of political movements, mm. which were born out of sheer desperation. You know, mm. there's the Black Lives Matter movement uh, all across the city. There's the anti-gun violence movement. Mm. There are the feminist movements. Mm. There are the transgender LGBTQ movements. So there is a new burst of energy right. which is channeling into creativity. Yeah. 
and i think you as a writer are intuitively picking up on that because you have always written about um, the relationships between people um, in a very soft and gentle way but also their relationships to city some of it is of course autobiographical so bombay you've written about calcutta mm. berlin and uh, I think you're picking up on something like that your yeah. connection to city via humanity. I'm certainly picking up on something when I'm here and walking down the roads. I'm also kind of um, aware of the fact that I am able to pick up uh that on this particular um visit. I'm open to it. I'm getting connected to it, you know, in the way that I wasn't in the past. Maybe because it it just exists now uh in a way that it didn't in the past decade. um so it's so i've been happy to be in new york this time yeah there's a calcutta air in new york i feel that too right yeah. now you know because everyone's writing poetry or attending a rally or making music or bringing out a magazine or yeah. you know putting up a play there's just so much going on writing mm. a book you know it's like uh, as if there's a outburst of creativity and energy at the same time as the end of the lockdown well that that's 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 good yeah yes the city is reclaiming itself i'm glad the lockdown way. and the pandemic have done some good because usually those kind of disasters uh, which you hope will kind of shake the system and make something new happen only strengthen the system um uh, this happened with the 2008 crash it has happened uh, again and again that you know you you think that this is going to weaken this this rot rotting system which has its stranglehold over us ever since markets deregulated and uh, post globalization but in st- in fact they end up strengthening the system but if 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 in new york it has uh, led to some sort of opening up then that's a, that's a good thing you know also i think new yorkers have realized that one thing that the failure of healthcare is possibly connected to as you said you know unregulated growth of uh, companies and markets mm. and uh, you know because when they needed hospitals there were not enough beds when they needed vaccines there were not enough vaccines mm. uh, when they needed healthcare workers there were not enough healthcare workers and so then that was a moment of reckoning for everyone here to realize that we need something more equitable and there cannot be greed over health mm. and that then led to an understanding of many things which sort of came together mm. that what is the kind of leadership we want what is the kind of system we want and new yorkers of course are at the front of it you know talking about it fighting for it and you know i'm glad because if anything i mean i was concerned about you know after glo- globalization uh, set in and after the end of the soviet union which of course is part of what this book talks about you know the the the, the changed world um that came in after the berlin wall collapsed i was i was concerned that if such a city as like new york with with its amazingly a vibrant history and, and diversity and diversity and also but its history uh, uh, as as is the same with any other great city uh, like calcutta of creating things on its own terms so it didn't care about where the, what the streets look like to the outsider or what its life looked like uh, to the outsider it was creating t- uh, things on its own terms i was concerned that it was it uh, after the fall of the berlin wall it had suddenly been promoted to to the first city of the world uh and and because america had become the kind of the sole superpower mm-hmm. and i was concerned that it 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 was being streamlined mainstreamed uh and um yeah uh, that that it it would lose it 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 was becoming complacent it was becoming aware of being uh of of its own history in a in a slightly sort of uh, deadened uh, way uh, um as as a kind of heritage of modernity uh, which it could claim uh, for itself in a particular way and the less it it self aware in that sense it is the better for for it in terms of making new departures Uh, and maybe this is happening now after the after the pandemic it's happening there is that but also you know the gentrification hasn't gone and of you course. know the soho for example shuts down at 5 o'clock 
because most of the shops are open, you know, run by the big brands and they've bought over all the artist lofts and the buildings, right? Yeah. So if you go there after 5.36, you'll find an empty Soho. You won't find the artists. You won't find the creative people in the evening. There'll be restaurants in some corners and the boarded shops. Yeah. So, of course, that has happened to New York, but there seems to be a resurgence at the same time and how that will be visible to somebody who's not a writer because you're picking up on sentiments as you're meeting people and walking around and all of that uh, is still maybe, it, you know, it could be a sequel to your book, uh, Sojourn, yeah. where, uh, you know, you are exploring Berlin after the fall of the wall. And you're trying to figure out what does this new world look like by walking between East Berlin and West Berlin very easily. Um, and... Um, you know, I want you to talk about the book a little bit, Sojourn. Yeah. But also, if you wrote a sequel to Sojourn in New York, like post the lockdown, post COVID, you know, the moment of reckoning that has happened in this great city, as you said, which was such a vanguard for modernity. What would that sequel look like? But first talk about Sojourn in Berlin after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Well, Sojourn is about, uh, is about a man who visits... Uh, Berlin in 2005 um, I did as I as I did so it, you know the book arises from a certain kind of a certain sense of uh, dislocation and a very a certain sense of being moved by the city uh, and a certain sense of um, unexpected familiarity with the city that I although I didn't know it that I felt at that time, and I wanted to investigate it, and there was no better way for me to investigate it than in the terms of this very open-ended form uh, that I kind of um, thought the novel could give me. Mm, you know, mm. so so um, uh, with, I could have investigated it in a non-fiction book or in an essay, but uh, but then I would have to just talk about my own experiences directly here. I could distance myself, invent, and. Uh, re recreate um, what I had experienced and even what I had not experienced. Mm, mm. So, so um, I think the main thing that I was struck by was well, one one of the things was my own sense of uh, familiarity with my sense of recognition, uh, which came to me in a foreign city that I. I know this place, I feel at home in it. Uh, especially when I went into the east of Berlin. Uh, that, that amplified, that sense amplified. And again, it has something to do with where I come from, my experience of Calcutta, of India. Uh, just as, you know, when I encountered New York in 1979, in a very different way, I made a connection that I'm in the same city again. You know, and the and that city was Calcutta. So it's a particular kind of city which I inhabit um, in, in books or in different places during my travels, whether that's, uh, you know, the, the Paris that's described by Benjamin or the Calcutta experience as a child or the New York I arrived at in 1979 or the Berlin that I kind of was trying to make sense of. It's the same city. What I, is I, that city? Uh, it's I, I I well this is what I'm trying to explore. Uh, it certainly the, it's this it's the city formed by 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 modernity, in which um, what happens in the next street uh, might be unknown to oneself and full of mystery. You know, um, so it has it. This city then has a particular kind of spiritual ethos. Uh, I'm only saying this because it. The moment I say this, I go back to uh, the encounter that Rinka, my wife, or Rosinka, and I had of the caves at Ajanta when we saw them for the first time, the frescoes, and uh, uh, you know the frescoes have these amazing, luminous, sometimes half-finished paintings on the walls of episodes. Uh, from the Buddha's life in in his various uh, incarnations, mm -hmm. and uh, one thing that she pointed out is uh, how how urban many of the images were. That that you know that y you could see through the window of a house, 
and far away you know you're looking at a, a character in a in a story to do with the mm-hmm. buddha and far away you're looking at a terrace of another house and beyond that into another house and so it was interesting as she said that you know gandhi said that um the true india is in the villages but but who knows where the true india is because here it was in ajanta in those frescoes mm-hmm. uh, uh, where the 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 mystery of the city and its spiritual ethos of constantly concealing and uncovering the unknown was being portrayed to us through yeah. these episodes in the buddha's life so what is this city i don't know what this city is you know but i recognize it when i'm in it now mm. one of one of the one of the things that um that i was also trying to investigate was the history of the cold war uh which which was a history that i grew up in possibly you grew up in as of well course. yeah the cold war was an Amer- american term possibly we didn't think of it as the cold war but that's what the americans called it uh, or somebody called it right uh, and and um but to us the world was what it was it was divided into um the soviet bloc and uh, and america and its allies uh, post post war and, and then there was non aligned movement and then there was us uh, non aligned and and i think we were pretty non aligned yeah. although we 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 kind of uh, had a kind had sympathies uh, with and for uh, the soviet union and there are there are good reasons for that and our own kind of economy was mm, uh, you know the market bit of it was um, controlled there were trade barriers and there was socialism and there was, so there was a interest there was an interesting mix yes yes and 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 that is where we grew up and actually the subconscious never registered the fact that this is a historic historic period it's going to end yeah. so when it did end for 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 people like us that is for modernity it it was a it was a huge moment i don't think even the end of empire compares with the end of whatever it was that gave us a sense of an alternative so once once socialism disappears the sense of an alternative disappears and i'm not saying this as a paid up socialist i'm just talking about the structure of our experience Absolutely. and 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 so i don't think the sense of an alternative was in any way impaired by by colonialism by imperialism and i don't think uh, independence made us in that sense more free we already had our ideas of what alternatives comprised and that's the, it, it's in those spaces that you know the great works of bengali literature and other indian literatures and the arts and cinema emerged in the 19th and 20th centuries but with the with the fall of the berlin wall certainly something ex, uh, you know something happened mm. where 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 a a a fundamental dimension of our experience uh, and what we could experience was taken away from us and um and after that although we may not have articulated it to us we do feel lost and we also have to go along certain routes uh, pr- prescribed to us by globalization and the free market and we are supposed to be happy taking those routes we are not even supposed to voice our unhappiness we are always supposed to be celebrating what you earlier called hype mm. hype is nothing but enforced celebration yeah so so you know um i wanted to uh, explore without saying all these things through a story although I, people keep saying i don't write stories but uh, you know <laughs> and 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 i i myself think that what i write is about what what exists on the margins of what's conventionally called story but i wanted to explore these things that i've just talked about through this man who feels uh, a sense of growing familiarity with this the the berlin he's exploring in 2005 a berlin which has still not lost a sense of the shift mm-hmm. uh, after the fall of the berlin wall and has still not lost a sense of 
the strangeness of being able to go into the East. It is possible to go there and to go there means to confront a different kind of order of things. It's still not lost that sense. Going Every time you go into the East, you rethink what it means, the East and where you came from, the West. And all these journeys all of us have made, whether we are aware of them of, uh, uh, or not, even as Indians, uh, we have made these journeys between one part of India or one part of the world or one part of Calcutta or one part of Bombay and another. Absolutely. We, have, we have made these journeys through our histories. So it, it, I wanted to kind of talk about this and the man's growing absorption in what he sees, mm. you know, th- his complete immersion in what he's discovering. And this immersion is a kind of loss of self. And this is why he begins to lose his ability to remember with, without any ex- anxiety because he's going deeper and deeper through his desire to be united with whatever it is he's absorbed in into, into the object of absorption. So there is no, there is no kind of, there's no panic mm. on his part, not even a proper kind of consciousness of the fact that he might be losing his memory. But th- this is because the loss of memory here is not an impairment. It is a corollary of his absorption. And this absorption, again, is something that interests me, whether I'm writing a novel over Berlin or about Calcutta or anything. Mm. Uh, and I wanted to explore the nature of that, this absorption over here in this particular context that I've just described. And that reminds me, talking about absorption and, uh, you know, just accepting even the change, but still noticing it, right? Not making it, there's no denial, it's visible and you accept it, but you also try to transcend it. And I've noticed this in your lived life also, Amit, because when I've been in Calcutta with you and your wife, Rosinka, I've actually walked through some neighborhoods like Hindustan Park, Hmm. looking through the windows of old buildings to see all the beautiful elements of the doors, the windows and the people who might have lived there and how hard you have both tried to preserve those buildings as heritage of Calcutta, as a memory of a time, which is not going to come back. We know that. But also as something to create a continuity between the past and the future, whatever is coming. And um, talk to me a little bit about what you're trying to do to save Calcutta. Oh, that is, uh, that's not, I mean, that would be too, 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 too huge a mantle to, to, to sort of, (laughs) yeah, but, but, um, but I, I don't know if I'm, yeah, I'm just arguing for a few things. I mean, and I began to become aware of the fact that these houses were, being relentlessly torn down, especially in South Calcutta, because the pressure of development and settlement is mainly being felt by the South of Calcutta, because the North is seen as the old town Hmm. without that Hmm. term being used of it. And it's neglected. The developers still haven't set their eyes on it because the the industry, the offices are more towards the south. Right. So, so, um, so you know, I noticed that you know houses were being sold to developers, and houses being sold, and these were extraordinary houses created in the south. Over, so the south is slightly younger than the north in mm-hmm. Calcutta. Uh, so the the these houses would have come up from the nineteen tens on onwards. Uh, and some of them in, from the 1910s have kind of a mix of Oriental Shantini Ketoni and Bauhaus kind of clean lines, but they're, they're very individualistic. Yeah. You don't see them anywhere else. And then you go into the 1930s and, and you see a kind of efflorescence of uh, Bauhaus uh, elements uh, all over South Calcutta, uh, quite remarkable in the residential districts. And now we are sitting over here in New York in a so-called historic district, but not so-called because we, it's been kind of designated as a historic district. District, And one always kind of um, feels a, it to be a double-edged sword mm-hmm. as to whether making something a historic district would be to kind of condemn it to being... Less know, developed. Uh, not less developed, to, to, to condemn it to a kind of artificiality. Okay. You know? Mm-hmm. Of, of of existence, of continuance. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm still glad to see these buildings I'm looking out on now, right now, from the studio uh, uh, opposite me. 
and the buildings I saw on the on my way here, many of them are quite old. They are not remarkable for being pretty, but but or, or beautiful. They are not monuments. Uh, they, but that's not what New York was about. No, a, 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 and neither is Calcutta about that. Calcutta is not a city of monuments. I I don't think it's major monument. Uh, Victoria Memorial is 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 uh, a, 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 any a, a, a place that I would encourage visit, visitors to go to. I would encourage them to go to the neighborhoods, just as here in New York. True. I'd ask them, you know, not to look for an imaginary, you know, Eiffel Tower or whatever, but to go to these neighborhoods because these are the most interesting. Uh, uh, um, bits of the city because this is where 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 those spaces and imaginations uh, were not only were created but have left their imprint. Mm. That you know something ordinary can be extraordinary. That's is, beautiful. Is is ex- exemplified by 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 these spaces, and the same is absolutely uh, the same is true of Calcutta, who whose whose imaginative achievements, as we know, you and I at least, are extraordinary. As extraordinary as anything else in the twentieth, nineteenth, uh, and twentieth centuries, anywhere else in the world. Now, um, I was arguing for these these kind of neighborhoods to be, which are in, internally extremely diverse in terms of the architecture. Mm. That is, you see uh, houses with similar features: the porthole shaped windows, the the curving verandas or balconies like uh, that that come from Art Deco. The porch uh, below, which comes from the b- bungalow, and and the 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 kind of red stone uh, uh, oxidized uh, stone floors, and uh, various other uh, other features. But each house is built along different lines, mm. and I, I, and I was saying that it's a pity that you know people don't think of reusing these houses, or living in them again, or that is to sell them to people who use them to 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 live in, and that. That, that the sale of these houses inevitably means the destruction or demolition of these houses because they're being sold to de- developers who are buying the houses for the price for the for the value of the land yeah, that they, they stand don't on. Care, yeah. yeah, so so you know, I, I I was asking people to rethink what what they're losing when they lose these neighborhoods, and also to stop thinking in terms of heritage or thinking in in terms of heritage being individual buildings or monuments. To think more in terms of our history of modernity. Very true, because you know that's the whole thing that modernity also has layers of memory. Yeah. And landscapes create those layers of memory. So yeah. when you talk about Bauhaus and Art Deco along with Shantini Ketan, yeah. then immediately it evokes all those stories associated with those things, right? Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. this happened. Mm-hmm. And also the universality of modernism, Mm -hmm. you know, that there were these people who had this kind of sensibility all over the world. Mm -hmm. And from Calcutta to New York to Berlin, which is why you never felt lost when you were in these three places subconsciously, because you were picking up something of that. Exactly. That's why you too must feel some kind of connection. I do. I feel very, very happy to be in New York in a time when all of India is in a flux, yeah. because I feel I'm closest to Calcutta by being in New York. Right. And this is something that um, many of us have not thought about because we don't talk about it sufficiently. So when we talk about India, we only talk about it in certain terms to do with what are the most kind of urgent themes of the day or or, or quintessential Indianness. And nor do Americans realize this. Uh, yeah. have, or, or people in the West, uh, they don't have a sufficient idea of this conversation you know of indian uh, modernity of, i yeah, think yeah. some architects might be able to talk to us about it or someone in the museum of modern art Maybe. but the way you are talking about it yeah that that is not happening uh because uh, we 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 break down cities and experiences and and countries around, along certain lines and this is what this book is not able to adhere to those lines you know the this this arrival in berlin but mm. but the fact that it is not a story about an Indian in Berlin, that is not what is of interest to me. And it's not. It's not a story about an Indian in Berlin. It's a story about an explorer of spaceship time at a moment in history, in a way. And, right. you know, you talk about, uh, in the book, you talk about a street which has bumps. And I think there's a German word for it, you know, where oh, yeah. there are little mounds or bumps. Yes, yes. And I think many people, because New Yorkers, many of them had to escape from Germany and come here. Yes. 
uh, you know, fleeing fascism. Those are little plaques uh, made of some kind of metal, which are very tiny. They are they are very moving because they are, as I've said somewhere else, not meant to be seen but to be noticed. Mm. So it, you see them by chance, and then you begin to study them. They are placed and embedded a, a, among the paving stones in neighborhoods or in front of buildings from which Jewish people were deported yeah. during the war. Uh, they are called stumbling stones in, in, in German. There's a particular term for it. Um, and um, so you're meant to stumble upon them, as it were, to mm. use the English idiom of uh, uh, discovering something accidentally. And, and, so, and, and each of these plaques are, 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 are tiny and they contain the, the name, uh, maybe even the pet name of the person mm -hmm. who was deported and their address. Uh, and they are moving not because only because they have this information, but because they do not draw attention to themselves. And yet they're called stumbling stones. So mm -hmm. you're supposed to stumble and reflect for a moment about what happened to these people because of unbridled fascism and what can happen again, right? Mm -hmm. So I think these stumbles, stumbling stones are what we are talking about also when we remove all our memory, eradicate it by changing landscapes for sheer profit and greed. Uh, and even in New York right now, we have movements going on mm -hmm. where people are organizing against developers, uh, you know, right near the Penn Station and other places right. Uh, right. to preserve the history. You know, I've spoke, uh, you, you, let, me, let me just say something about cities like Calcutta and you know you you said that i i'm working towards kind of trying to conserve or not allow its um its its its, its historic neighborhoods of modernity to be to become a thing of the past uh and over there and that that also connects to my other interests also as a writer historic and modernity. So these are two seemingly contradictory words. Uh, so by modernity, I, me I then mean something that contains history and is also open-ended in its definition, th that it is open-ended. It's not historic in a sense that there is a pre-assigned or prefabricated parameter of value that you, know, you, you see you know uh, the Taj Mahal. Uh, not to not to uh, by any any means downplay the greatness of the Taj Mahal. It is a wonderful uh, thing, but uh, uh, but you know there are certain parameters by which we recognize uh, palaces, the houses of kings and queens, uh, what kind of clothes they wore, or the clothes and uh, rights uh, and uh, you know ways of life of of the past uh, and past epochs whether it's through camels and turbans or or you know other things that we we have prefabricated parameters with which to 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 assign value with modernity we are encountering something that is ourselves mm -hmm. it is open ended ourselves but it may have be begun to pass already because we are in the age of globalization which doesn't recognize ourselves in that particular way but you know it's here in modernity that we get a sense of the importance of rooms you know curtains uh, toothbrushes uh, these are the the banal appurtenances of the modern you know much more so than just the, the, the rockets and you know whatever going to the moon uh, the, it's 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 this secret life and as a woman for me it's also emancipation frankly right because, you know, the idea of the modern was also all these different ideas which redefined what equality looked like, what um, dignity looked like, uh, what functionality even looked like, right? So it's, certainly it's a redefinition of spaces through both the men and women, especially for the middle class and the emergence of the woman uh, as, uh, um, as, 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 a, as, as a kind of... Uh, creating a different set of parameters mm. uh, as to how to understand this modernity. But th there being constant give and take between the two in, in to how this these people emerge. Um, so, so we are not, uh, what I'm saying is we are not talking about the monumental. We are no. talking about something indeterminate. 
and 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 we it is more difficult to have a vocabulary for that so when we talk about modernity we also assign value to it through more determinate values that is progress rockets technology etc but this uh, mysterious quality of the inde- indeterminate everyday of you and me uh, which doesn't have the same value uh, uh, as they would if we were uh, you know kings or queens or princes or princesses uh, is the stuff of modernity it's when we emerge and in all our banality you know Absolutely. and this i refer to this in the book as well uh, you know when he goes to the jewish museum he encounters uh this 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 modernity which 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 was then kind of made to made to vanish because what what is being encased in the jewish museum very ordinary lives yeah very uh, uh, you know what's left is a handkerchief what's left is a, a a coloring book a child's coloring book a doll and he says the narrator says i i know i know these things already you know mm. so we are talking about the spirit so uh what i'm saying is that this is where the, um, my interest in calcutta the, the cities it's part of this imagining trying to imagine what what this open ended thing is to find a language for it that's also happening in the novels mm. now uh, as far as intuiting things in the air so therefore you have to find a way uh because you're intuiting these things you the, you know these these are things which uh, you are not you don't have pre-assigned categories as i said uh with which to understand or value them you are intuiting their value uh, and then one must find a language for them for them i, I have i i have i was not a very good student there there were certain um um subjects i was not good at like you know science maths and and i was never very interested in history um so uh, but this is not to say that i was not actually interested in history actually i think i was but not in the way it was taught in the classroom and not in the way that the classroom extends itself into the, into the way we think of history now so one of my first not this is where the in, intuition the, which happens begins to happen ever since you're a child so i remember this cup the uh, illuminated cup tea cup or was it a no it was a teapot pouring tea into a tea cup mm. in Ch- on chorungi mm. which uh, i encountered this kind of moving thing, illuminated advertisement as a child in the 60s as the car was going further south and i have a memory of this and this memory for me is Lipton. not in yeah so for this memory for me is not just a memory of calcutta or or my childhood it is a it is an entry point into a history mm. and that's the, that's how i see it i see those entry points as being important it's so beautiful because you're saying hold on to what we have right now and it's being obliterated and uh, through the act of writing through the act of making a movie or even talking about it or holding on to a building or a book or a memory we might be able to keep some of the values which have improved our lives of modernity and it's it's a bit like you know i not only often... to repose faith completely in recognized modes of pedagogy knowledge and the archive yes ways of mastering the past not only to repose faith in them but to to kind of follow these uh, uh, intuitions as you call them which may be um, uh, come up uh, manifest themselves as memories from early childhood uh or or a, a something that happens in the now at in this moment but they they are the kind of entry points into history absolutely because you know in the last two years i've read a hundred years of solitude like three times mm-hmm. because i find some thing which connects me very deeply to it right now and i've been thinking about it that what is it and i feel that our hundred years of solitude is over it began in 1917 you know when gandhi went into champaran and did civil disobedience or lenin went into something and presented the april thesis or whatever for different mm. cultures in different countries but it was all in 1917 and uh, what happens then is um, we have 2017 where uh, you know people who were assassinated gandhi take power or you know we can see what's happening with uh, who's taken over in russia and what's happening 
with Europe right now and other places. So I sometimes wonder that, you know, somebody who was 20 years old in 1945, he must have had such a sense of freedom and the possibility of modernity, you know, because it had come through science, through art, through architecture, through philosophy. And it was driving everything at that moment, right? And he must have thought that, uh, you know, colonial, all the hierarchies are gone. Colonialism, feudalism, fascism, uh, and I can do anything with the world. And that led to such a burst of creativity, which we now see in museums, right? Mm. And enjoy it. And we say, oh, have you seen so-and-so? There's a hopper there. He's talking about urban alienation or whatever. Let's go to the Whitney. But um, now in 2017 and post that, there is such a sense of it's all over, yeah. what's coming next. There's an anxiety, there's a curiosity at the same time. And it's like a hundred years of solitude where I feel that the baby with the tail of a pig is born everywhere. Blood is flowing under the door and going into the river and two or three friends or people who know each other will meet in a bar and only they will have a memory that there was something called the United Fruit Company. There was a life before that. Mm -hmm. There was a train which went out with dead bodies. There was a bookstore in the city. And because by the time these characters meet in 100 years of solitude, there is no bookstore. There are no books. And these three people who are not friends, but they exchange a glance because they have the memory of that. So I think your book Sojourn is also like, a gesture of exchanging a glance with somebody that you know that it existed and you're exchanging a glance with our generation because all of us know that we lived through this modernity and there are many, many flaws in it, which is why people are rejecting it, shouting against it, changing it. But we also know what it did for us in terms of our freedom, our everyday life, all those uprooting of hierarchies in a very modern, essential functional wave. So there was no waste to it, you know, what was happening. Mm. And we appreciate that because it brought humanity closer to us, which is why the sense of grittiness didn't bother us because we realized that, you know, the money saved in this is going to help someone come closer to my street to live in, who I would have never encountered uh, in any other way in the past. Mm. So um, I think that the future is... Uh, Unknown even now because, mm. uh, you know, does is the journey of modernity over? We qu don't quite know because there is a new term called postmodernism. But how do you reach postmodernism without embracing modernity fully? And that journey is still to be made fully. So, um, and I think New York is in that moment where it is still pushing to see what are the possibilities of this. Mm. And um, I, I, the question I want to ask you in that is that what is the future of modernity? What is the future of freedom? How, what do you think about it? Are the two even interconnected? Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, there is a connection uh, between the two. I don't want to get stuck with the term modernity or to see be uh, seen to be a votary of modernity. I want to be seen as a kind of part-time interpreter of the word. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, I do other things as well. But yes, I'm a part-time interpreter of the word. I want to understand uh, uh, um, its its meaning. Um, I don't want to identify it with simply with progress. Um, and I want to, sh uh, uh, nor, nor is it a kind of, um, so it's, you know, a lot of people think mo modern means West, means the Western, and means, Progress as the Enlightenment or, or the West has kind of defined it. And, and you know, uh, I want to see the modern also as a critique of the Enlightenment and a, a critique of the way the Enlightenment understands, you know, teleology and progress. Uh, and But it's a critique that is not a kind of golden age critique, that it's not saying, uh, it's not a fascist critique. Uh, saying go back to some golden past. Uh, it's 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 a kind of embrace of the unfinished, of mm -hmm. the incomplete, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it, it it's through that that um, it it kind of um, creates this critique. And this critique uh, occurs through time, uh, in 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 cultures and art forms, uh, in in ways that we don't ordinarily think of as 
modern or modernist, but you know, they, I would call those kind of instances modernist. I mean, where uh, in our classical dances, the predominance of gesture, you know, to 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 kind of um, to indicate worlds, to create worlds. So so you don't create worlds by painstakingly recreating them as you would on a Western set uh, of a kind of proscenium stage, but you you gesture towards them. So that 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 kind of synecdoche, I would see as part of this kind of embrace of the partial, the unfinished, uh, the, 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 the kind of privileging of process. So um, does it have the future? I mean, this, so I'm no longer talking about modernity, but this open-endedness, this, 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 this kind of, this privileging of the gestural, of the unfinished, of the, of the of process over, over finished product, because finished product is development. Development, first world, these these idiotic terms or, or these kind of pervasive and and that there has to be an output uh, has to be an output and that everything has to be filtered out oh, and yeah. what we see must be a, a a finished product and if we don't see the finished product if the thing is still in process then we are in the third world or it's it's undeveloped and how do we bring back the uh, the developing into what we really want to be. It's not developed. We don't want to be developed. That is that that is what keeps things out. Mm -hmm. It's modernism was a was a vocabulary which perfected among various other movements in the past, including those in our country, and I've just spoken about Kathakali, Khayal, earlier than that, Raga, which uh, show us that where we want to be is process. We don't want to be developed. We want developing is where the imagination kind of plays out. So uh, yes, it, it it has a future because that's that's who we have to be. But it is always a fight. Uh, the, the idea of development makes us, lulls us into thinking that we progress, we, we sort of achieve certain, uh, some of our ideals, we arrive at this moment where we are liberated and that's it. Now mm. we don't have to worry. Mm. Our fathers did it for us or we did it 50 years ago or 30 years ago. We, it's settled. It's not. It is always a fight. Whether we are talking about emancipation in gender or something else to do with race or whether we are talking about our right to read and think and write in a particular way and for us to bring that into the world, it, it is never a settled question. It is always something that has to be fought for. But the more we fall in line, the less we fight. You know, uh, uh, what our problem today is the extent to which we want to fall in line yeah. in order to survive. Because survival has become the actual kind of credo of our, of our time. We all want to survive. And we think this uh, falling in line approach might work, whereas that may not work you know because as you said that you know the process is the end in in fact that's kind of a gandhian modernity too because for gandhi also the means were the end you know and that's really what nonviolence is like the means are the end because if you use violence then you're going to get an outcome of violence in the process of whatever happens and so the means are the end is a very difficult um, thing to explain who are to people who are just completely, as you said, outcome that this is the end. It was there always, is no end. It was always difficult, uh, and 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 people always had to find ways again and again through history to to address that difficulty and find new ways to to speak about these things. It's not as if you know somebody explained it now; it doesn't need to be explained anymore. It's done. Yeah, it's true. And this is Amit Chaudhary speaking in a free voice, who is known as the mass. He's a professor too. And he is known, one of his students told me, as the master of the comma. And my last <laughs> question to Amit is going to be about the comma. Why do your students think you are the most masterly uh, professor, writer who understands where to put the comma? Really? I yes. told you that? Yeah. Okay. I have no idea. I mean, I'm trying to think. Um, this was pointed out by a reviewer once. Uh, a reviewer of my second book, Afternoon Rag, not 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 this particular, but the, about the comma. Uh, 
some of my sentences used to be long, but even when they are short, I mean, I must know where the uh, the the what what the pauses are about. For me, the pauses are very important. The silences are very important. The comma is an internal pause, an internal moment of silence. Maybe yoking two unlikes together very often, not just yoking two kind of things together that will cu- be cumulatively used to to shore up an argument but uh yoking two different things going off in different directions yeah over there you have to navigate the different directions and the comma uh which will look illusorily like something that that is you know joining things up in a nice way is actually making two unlikes come together uh and pulling it off Mm-hmm. So there you must know uh, where to pause where to create that little break and yet join. Yeah. Know? Yeah. So yeah. that's only one interpretation. Of course I'm and I know that you were po- composed a new rag and uh, how do you compose a rag like how how You can't you... compose a rag. I mean mm, sorry please please I'm going to because you. these are new yorkers who are going to be listening to my podcast and new yorkers and beyond you know free mm-hmm. voice please explain to them what a rag is so uh, so in in explaining to them what a rag is uh, one goes into the reasons for my composing a new one composing a new one so i wrote a book called finding the rag it came out last year and um it was about my relationship with indian classical music uh, you know i grew up uh, uh, not really listening to indian classical music at all my mother was a, a very great singer of rabindranath sangeet rubijaya choudhury uh, many i many of her uh, records came out from hmv and she but she had a very classicist uh, um, approach to music um, for her music was about tonality tone purity of tone and not emotion you know which is what robin the shongit is often about so um she she didn't distinguish between these two she thought purity of tonality is emotion you don't have to bring something else to it now the, um but then i myself began to become drawn to hindustani classical music when i was 16 that's when i began to learn it and committed myself to it so anyway um so the, the book is about all of this finding the rag uh uh here one has to kind of pause to think about what a rag is i'll try to keep it short i mean a rag is not a mode or a scale that is a scale goes from up the lower tonic to the upper tonic sa to sa or do to do in a linear fashion mm. the rag does not move in a linear fashion so the rag uh, so there may be two or three or four rags which have identical notes therefore inhabit the ident- and the same scale if one were to think in terms of scales and modes but uh, are different as ragas because they have different progressions by different progressions i mean that each time they go up they come down again and mm-hmm. then they go up again and then they finally climb up to the top from the lower sa to the upper top upper sa and this happens through this movement of going up so in yama nire gama pa pa re pa re comes down to re sa so it's not pa ma ga re sa you can say pa ma ga re sa but pa re is a more definitive phrase and then so and so on and so forth it gradually goes up in this fashion up down Mm. in the up as you can see ni is the lower seventh re is the in the middle octave is the second note so ni re ga not sa re ga mm. the sa is is the tonic is omitted in the way it goes up so again certain notes are being delayed or deferred or omitted in this particular exploration so let's say that the rag is a, a new way of thinking of the scale it puts to one side a normal way of thinking of the scale which which must have existed at the time which is up to down uh, sorry down to up in a linear fashion and instead um looks at um uh, characteristic clusters of notes and what creative possibilities those clusters and interrelationships have mm, mm. on the way up and down 
this is it. one one other thing since i'm mentioning rag yaman what i should mention an apocryphal story about amir khusro um that amir khusro was as you know in the delhi sultanate a, a, an amazing poet yeah. pre renaissance renaissance man poet musician thinker writer mm, when was it was it uh, 12th century um 12th uh, at the end of the mughal empire of- so dinka delhi sultanate 1300 hundreds um so um so there is a story about him which is also a story about the the creation the genesis of rag yaman like like the tagores uh, and many others uh, like mm-hmm. sholil choudhury various others he uh, khusro was also a collector of tunes yeah so anyway uh, this yemeni merchant arrives in delhi and he's humming a tune and um khusro rem- me- commits it to memory mm. and this tune he turns into rag yaman that's why it's called yaman i didn't even know that all these years well this is an apocryphal story don't take it to be history but this is one of the stories Achha. about the genesis i i cannot vouch for its absolute ac- accuracy but it sounds like a plausible story because this is the way uh, uh, um creation works mm. and and especially in india where so much of creativity is working with available material or found material uh so you know like you know tagore borrows from various kind of forms in order to create his songs including you know baul or i uh, uh, a scottish or irish drinking songs mm. he borrows mm. uh, south south indian carnatic music he borrows from a range of forms so khusro uh, apparently does this with yaman now w- what this means and what i f- what i have felt not necessarily because of this story is that more and more i have felt this year is that the rag is an also an investigation into a melody or a tune Th- these melodies all already exist they exist as folk melodies as chants as songs the rag slows down these melodies somebody at some point whether it's in the 10th century or in the 2nd century uh, or the 2nd century bc uh, uh, transposes the tune from a folk air or melody or a song or a chant into this domain of high culture mm-hmm. it's secular it's secular high culture a philosopher musician does the transposition and what he does is he slows up the melody the melody slowed up reveals the clusters of interrelationships between notes yeah so the tune is you know a particular kind but slowed down you begin to then notice characteristic uh um kind of structures mm. and clusters of notes which then the raga is a way of exploring and the exploration is amplified most in the 20th century when the khayal is slowed down further by people like ustad wahid khan and ustad ustad abdul wahid khan and ustad uh, amir khan so um i was speaking to some participants in a course i was teaching online this year for ashoka mm-hmm. called ashoka x and i just said to them like let's imagine that you know this um, middle bit of this irritating song o oh sole mio uh, which is a kind of western uh, composition um, l- imagine that this were a, a a folk tune doing the rounds in india mm. how would this work if we slowed it down in order to observe its characteristic clusters of notes on the way up and on the way down and i did it for 2 minutes mm, mm. and this led me to think i could actually do it and create a rag from it so it was a joke and from this kind of joke which was also serious i created this rag and i performed it for the first time at the hollywell music room in july in oxford okay and now i'm going to be performing it at smith it's part of an ongoing experiment and investigation and a a am a way of thinking about these things which we usually term as tradition 
and don't think about that much it's so beautiful the cluster and the slowing down and interconnectedness and i hope that one day you write a book which connects new york and calcutta in this urban sensibility that we do not want to lose and we want to see it as unfinished business for a long time thank you amit thank you I'm Ruchi Ragupta and thank you for listening to a free voice. Subscribe to our podcast to get notifications of new episodes or check us out at ruchiragupta.com. The podcast is produced by Ram Devineni with Ratapalix and Bauri Poetry. Special thanks to Leela Kapoor and Anika Kothari. This podcast series is funded by the Citizen Diplomacy Action Fund. which is sponsored by the US Department of State and implemented by Global Ties US in partnership with the Office of Alumni Affairs and the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs additional support from New York State Council on the Arts Governor of New York State and the New York State Legislature